But we're going to have a great time of the Lord tonight because God's given me a word. Not only has God given me a word for you tonight, but God confirmed it. And you'll see what I mean if you'll turn to Exodus 33. Exodus 33. I did not communicate with anyone about what I was going to preach. I did mention to pastor my title, but I didn't tell him I was going to preach on it. I just said, I'm going to see this tonight. A while ago when he came out to see if I was getting everything hooked up. But I want to look in the 33rd chapter and the 18th verse of the book of Exodus. And you tell me if God hadn't set this up tonight. And he said, this is Moses talking. I beseech thee, would you read the rest of this out loud? Show me thy glory. Now, did God set us up tonight or did he not? I think the worship team would have been listening to the same God I've been listening to today. I wish you'd just lift your hands and worship the Lord right now and ask him to just show us his glory tonight for the next little while. Lord Jesus, I pray that the presence of God would fill this sanctuary and that you would literally show us your glory. Let the word of God be with us for a few moments tonight. And I pray that the Holy Ghost would blanket this place with the anointing. And Lord, that you would walk in this place and throw your weight around and do what you do best. Bind up a broken heart. Touch a lost soul. Lord, mend someone's life. Fill someone with the baptism of the Holy Ghost tonight. Let someone be baptized in the precious name of Jesus tonight. Let the glory of God fill this room. And let us start this first night of meeting off with an encounter with the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Before I begin tonight, I want to poll the crowd if I can tonight. And brother, I, I've, I've preached all week, so I don't have a whole lot of voice, so please don't kill my microphone tonight if you don't mind. <clears throat> I, I, I love the sound people. I do. Amen. And the multimedia people and all of you people and everybody. I just love the family of God. I'm glad I get to be part of the family of God. God's been too good to me. He really has. I want to ask a question. What is your expectations for the next three services? Are we doing this just because it's time to do it? Are we doing it just because Brother Tibbs felt like we need to do it and this is when it, our schedules could match up? Or have we come here tonight from a world of chaos and a world of trouble with every one of us having things on our plate back home that we're having to deal with, that we've entered this building tonight saying, God, that's gonna have to wait outside I've come here tonight for some supernatural help to be able to deal with what I got to deal with when I leave here tonight. In my motor coach, I have a DeWalt cordless 20 volt XR brushless drill. It's one of the best drills I've ever had. Half inch powerhouse of a drill. I've been in construction most all of my life and, and when you travel and preach, I've been preaching the gospel since I was 12 and never really had a real job in my life. So all my life has been helping build churches and, and helping my uncles and my cousins and different ones. Since I was 16, I've traveled for the last 32 years preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and this has been my life and I've dedicated my life to that. But I. I have a fascination. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I'm weird. I love tools. If you go open the, the bays of my coach out there, one guy looked at all the toolboxes and he said, you're not a man of much faith, are you? I said, when I'm broke down on the side of the highway, it's a lot of wisdom. Amen. Amen. 
I grew up in a diesel mechanic shop that my uncles had all of my life, so I can pretty much mechanic on all of my things. So I love tools. I have a second addiction, and it's sound equipment. I love all kinds of sound equipment. I collect it. I'm, I'm buying, swapping, selling, trade all the time. I love sound equipment. I love sound boards. I love all the, the latest, greatest stuff. I'm, I'm into this stuff. That's been my life. But let me talk to you about my little cordless drill. My little cordless drill is a, is a hoss. It's a powerhouse. As long as the battery is charged. It doesn't matter how cold it is outside or how hot it is outside. It doesn't matter what the task before it is. If it's charged from within, it can handle it. But the worst thing I can do for that drill is keep the battery on the charger at all times and never expend it. Are you with me here? Every once in a while, that thing needs to be worked until it has no life within it and it has to slow charge from the beginning. Let me say this, dear friend. If the only thing you do as a Christian is come to church and soak up the glory of God, you're going to have a short life as a believer. Your life is to be spent for the work of God. That cordless drill is no good to me as long as the battery is sitting on the charger. It's only good when it's pulled out, connected, and put to work. I don't care what kind of move of God we have here tonight. If you don't take what we find here tonight to the streets, we're no good to the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody. If you don't do something beyond showing up to the house of God, you're really not doing much for the kingdom of God. Heaven's not looking for any more museums. This is not a weapon or a tool museum. This is a place where we come to be recharged because there's a world out there that needs somebody with an anointing and a glory and a power to touch lives. There should be something that rises within all of us that when we walk out into a lost world, they connect with us because they've got real problems. Come on, somebody. You may not be addicted, but there's somebody out there that is. Your marriage may be going just fine, but there's somebody out there tonight that's hurting and crying that needs a breakthrough, that needs a miracle, and you hold this treasure in an earthen vessel. Give the Lord a clap over the praise. Demonstrations of glory are not for you to set up and say, hmm, that felt good. Hmm, oh yeah, ooh. Biblical revelation is not given to you so you can be impressive and just walk around like I know more about the Bible than everybody else. You understand that you're never going to get no more revelation from the scripture until you start giving what you already got, don't you? You don't understand that the give and it shall be given principle doesn't only just work with the money in your wallet. That's right. That's right. As you start giving, oh, I come to tell you something. When you come to a Sunday school class, whatever that teacher teaches, you ought to be going out and giving it away at work tomorrow. Whatever this man of God gets in the pulpit and preaches, you ought to be giving away tomorrow. Until when you walk back in here for a midweek service, you're so drained and so empty, ready to be refilled. Come on, somebody. We're trying to turn the church into spiritual think tanks. God's not looking for think tanks. God's looking for somebody that'll take this message to a lost and dying world and give them the glory. Yes. Yes. You see, Pastor Tibbs can't see everybody that you see on a daily basis. Now, if I'm going to pour, I do my own oil changes. And when I get ready to put oil in my engine, I grab a funnel. Starts out big, brings it down to a point to put it in a precise place. But that stuff is too expensive to be wasted and poured out on the ground. So let me tell you what happens. If today I grab that funnel... I set it down in the engine slot and the tube where it all pours out. I grab a gallon of synthetic Mobile One engine oil and I start filling the funnel, but if the funnel stopped up, 
It's going to eventually come to the top. It's going to run over. Are you here? And I'm just going to keep pouring it, right? I'm just going to keep pouring that oil until it's just all over the ground because I just bought it to pour it out. Right? No, that's not what I'm going to do. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to quit putting it in there until something happens that lets it out to put it where I send it. You want to know why you come to church and the anointing never bothers you, the glory never touches you, the Spirit of God never gets you, the sermons just seem boring and somebody else is getting something glorious out of it. You've got your funnel plugged up and God's not interested in putting any more in you until you're willing to give away what God's already deposited in your life. God's not interested in wasting his anointing. He doesn't just want your cup to run over. He wants to give it to you freely so you can give it to someone. Someone else. Well, I'm not doing too good tonight, but I need to finish up here. You to understand Exodus 33:18, you really need to have a working knowledge of Exodus 31, 32, and 33. And I hope today I can do this justice before we leave this service tonight. Some of you are hungry. Some of you like wonder how long he's going to preach tonight. Will we be able to beat the Baptist to Kentucky Fried Chicken tonight after the service? In Exodus 31, 32, and 33, Moses is called to the mountain with God where God is going to talk to Moses about some spectacular things. Now let's go back to the book of Genesis. God always wanted himself a nation. As a matter of fact, when God found his best friend, Abraham, when God finally got his first loyal friend, oh, you didn't hear me. You know, down through the years, God had had some friends. Adam, Adam messed up on him. Eve, Eve messed up on him. He did have Noah, and he had Enoch, took Enoch on home with him. Enoch's still spending the day with the Lord because there's no night there. And so he finds a loyal friend, probably the most loyal friend he ever had, a man by the name of Abraham, who said, Abraham, I want you to leave your mama, your daddy, your kin folks, everybody. And I want you to just go to a place, I'm not even gonna point on the map where it is, I'm just gonna tell you, you just follow me. Abraham says, all right. He says, here's the deal, Abraham, if you'll do this, I'm gonna give you a son, I'm gonna give you a seed. It's gonna be the stars of the sky and the sands by the seashore. And I'm gonna make of you a great nation. Everybody say this with me. God promised Abraham that he could be the father of not a nation, but nations. Did you hear me? What a promise. What a promise. You're gonna be the father of multiplied nations. Well, Mo, Abraham has the boy when he's 100 years old or his wife's 90 years old they have the baby boy and the baby boy grows up to maturity and God says now I want you to take because in Isaac your seed's going to be called I want you to take the very promise I gave you and I want you to kill it I want you to take the only hope that you have for my promise to come to pass in your life and I want you to kill it so Abraham takes the boy. I'll get back to this one day, this one night, this week. And, and, and Moses, and Abraham kills the boy. Gonna, getting ready to kill the boy. And the Lord stops him says, I know you've not withheld your only son from me. So I know that you love me. So now I know that you are a loyal follower. So you're going to be the father of many nations. Now, Abraham had that boy Isaac. That boy Isaac had children. Jacob had children, had a grandson, and had 12, 12 boys. And, and they went into Egypt, one family. Y'all remember that? One family just trying to keep from starving to death. You see, circumstances will drive you into God's will. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Don't ever forget that. 
And so he drives him. I, I, can, can I just talk to you all tonight? Is that all right? So he takes them down as one family into Egypt. But the more they're afflicted, the more they grow and the more they multiply. Now watch this. They walk into Egypt one family. But on the night they leave Egypt, they leave 12 nations. Twelve complete nations walk out of that place. Uh, and God says, here's the deal. I've always wanted to be in the nation building because the principle of blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord is an amazing principle. And God said, if I can just get one group of people that are my people, that will be called by my name, that'll honor me, that'll keep my laws and my precepts. I want everyone in the world to see what an amazing nation there is. They're not gonna need bridges. I'll just make ways through the will, through the water for them. They're not gonna need a grocery store. I'm just gonna send them uh, the food to them in the morning and in the afternoon. Amen. Are y'all here? As a matter of fact, it's going to kill some of you ladies to death. Y'all just going to die right here. They ain't going to need a shoe store for 40 years. Can any of you ladies deal without shoe shopping for 40 years? That'd make y'all all backslide right there, wouldn't it? Just ever. God said they're going to be so blessed that they're going to be the envy of the world that they're my people. Oh, my friend. May I tell you today, God's still looking for that people who will be dedicated to his name that he can make the wonder of the world. You are supposed to be the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill. Oh, don't come in with your lip dragging the ground. It's not a tragedy to be a child of God. It's the most prestigious thing in the world to know that I walk under the banner of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my healer. He's my savior. He's my deliverer. I I have a supernatural out in every area of my life. I am backed by the supernatural glory of a sovereign God. We are the people of God. We are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. No nation is as blessed as the people of God. There's no group that is as blessed as we are. If you need a miracle tonight, it's in the house. If you need healing, it's in the house. If you need financial provision, my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God just wants you to follow him and let him be your all in all. That's all he wants. Yes. <laughs> so, night of the Passover, we often misquote things. We say God sent the death angel. There's no mention anywhere in Scripture of a death angel. Nowhere in the Bible. God said, you know, we relegate to angels. God said he's going to do himself. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. God said, be behind the door with your shoes on, your staff in your hand, blood on the doorpost and on the lentils. Are y'all here? We talk to each other. That's how we get acquainted. And God says, this night at midnight, I will pass over. And when I see the blood, he didn't say I'm delegating this to an angel. God did that himself. How many ever heard that term when old Gabriel blows a trumpet? Anybody ever heard that? Y'all realize that ain't biblical? Gabriel ain't coming to blow a rapture trumpet for you. Paul told us exactly who's going to blow that rapture. For the Lord himself. Yes. Yes. That's enough to make a mummy dance yes. right there. Gabriel didn't die for me. Michael didn't die for me. But Jesus has invested everything in me. And he's coming back for me all by himself. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Maybe there's hope to me. So listen. God says, now, I brought y'all out of Egypt miraculously. I mean, no other army could have done for y'all what I did. Are y'all here? Now watch this. God said, well, I'm going to call you out tonight, and I want you to leave your houses. Everybody say houses. Leave your houses and everything as it is in Egypt. 
and I want you to go with me. I'm not even going to, he's just like Moses. I, ain't, I can't point it on a map. I just want you to follow me. I'll be back to that in just a minute. And I'm going to take you to a land and I'm going to give you houses. Say, leave your house. I'm going to give you a house. I'm going to give you houses you didn't build. I'm going to give you vineyards you didn't plant. Because when we walk into Canaan, you're going in not as your own. You've been bought with a price. Maybe that don't excite you. But can I tell you, Jesus doesn't waste things. You all remember this? You remember this? He fed 5,000. And when he got through, he said, boys, make sure you pick up the leftovers. We ain't wasting nothing. <laughs> when he got ready to be buried, y'all remember this story when they put him in the tomb? How much did that tomb cost him? It didn't cost him anything? What? Well, how'd he get it? Huh? How'd he get that tomb? Did he buy it? Huh? He didn't, he didn't buy that tomb? Well, how'd he get it? He borrowed it, did he? He didn't waste money on something he didn't need very long. If he just needed it for the weekend, he just borrowed that baby. Are y'all with me here? Because he don't waste money on anything that he's not going to use. So when he needed a tomb for a weekend, he just borrowed that tomb. But when he wanted to get a hold of you and I, he bought the church because he wanted to live with us forever. We meant more to him. I, got yeah. Yeah. I said he borrowed a tomb, but he bought a church because he invested in his people that walk in his name. Come on, give the Lord a clap off for the praise. Say it with me. He borrowed a tomb, but he bought a church. Glory to God. He doesn't waste it. My friend, I come to tell you, he hasn't borrowed you. He bought you. He invested you. He shed his blood for you. He gave everything for you because he wants to be your God and he wants you to be his people. Woo, I feel a preaching spirit in this place today. I don't even feel like I drove 24 hours to get here. I, I, feel, I feel the Holy Ghost up in this place tonight. Hang on. Now watch this. So God says, here's the deal. I do everything decently and in order. We're going to come in that land. You're walking in in my name. So I don't want you walking in with your head down. I don't walk, want you walking in like the devil's been after me all week. Bless his holy name. I don't want you all walking up like your poodle just got run over. I want you to come in terrible as an army with banners. I want you to come. You see, I don't come in rejoicing because Jesus has an ego that needs to hear me praise him. Come on, somebody. Jesus loves you whether you praise him or not. God don't have some ego that he's doing. this no egomaniac that he wants us to praise him. But he wants the world to know that we're excited. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't praise him tonight because I have to. But I sure would like for you to know I'm thrilled to death to be called a child of God. I'm excited because when I needed help and nobody could help me, Jesus came through. When I needed a miracle and no one could give it, Jesus came through. I'm glad I'm part of the family of God. I'm glad I'm part of a royal family. I'm glad I got a holy seat. I'm glad to be part of a holy nation. And when I come in this house tonight, don't you ask me to sit quiet and twiddle my thumbs and pick my nose. I want to shout glory. I'm so excited to be part of the family of God walking in the power of the most prestigious name ever known to man. God says, they're going to walk in. And watch this, watch this. When they left Egypt, God said, now y'all going to need shopping money. <laughs> You're going to have a shopping mall, but I want you to have spending money. And they walked out with all the wealth of Egypt on their backs. They had the bank of Egypt with them. Are y'all here? They walked out wealthy critters and nowhere to spend it. It's a sad thing to, to think about that the first thing they spent all the money that God gave them was to buy a God to replace the one who gave it to them with. Are you here? 
The first thing they wasted God's blessing on was to buy another God to replace the God who gave it to them. So God calls Moses up to the mountain and says, I need you to come up here. And I'm going to write the bylaws and constitution of this new nation. And we're going to ratify this as a nation. And so we're going to do the legal documents and the paperwork. Are y'all ready? So Moses climbs the mountain to get the law and the rule from God. And he's going to bring it down and the people are supposed to say, we'll follow him. It's going to be voted on and ratified and a nation's going to be born. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost here. And when Moses gets to that mountain, now watch this. This will make a mummy dance. When Moses gets to God's office on the mountain, God's got his stationery laid out. I challenge you from Genesis to the Revelation, especially in the Old Testament, when God got ready to write something, show me anything he ever used to write on besides rock. The only time that we read where Jesus, who was God in the flesh, ever wrote something, he wrote it. So when God gets, when Moses gets to God's office, God's got the table of stone laid out. And he's got his ink pen in hand. And God starts writing in the stone with his finger. Am I boring y'all yet? Can I have a few minutes to keep boring you? God takes his finger and begins to write in the stone. Men write things on paper. It can be tore up. It can be erased. God doesn't have an eraser on his pencil because every word out of the mouth of God is forever settled in heaven. Yes. God never wrote one promise and said, oops, I didn't mean that. God never made you one promise and said, oops, I, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. I talked out of, neighbor, if God put it in this book and that promise is to you and you're walking according to the word of God, it's forever settled in heaven. This is where we get the term, it's written in stone. <laughs> It can't be reversed. It can't be removed. It's, it's been written in stone. Oh, but what about Jesus? Well, let's, let's get there. Do you all remember that, that they brought a woman caught in the act of adultery to Jesus? And, and they said these words to him. Lord, this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. I like how pious they are. Y'all ready for this? Moses' law said. Y'all remember who wrote the law of Moses, don't you? They come to Jesus as if Jesus didn't know what he had already wrote. <laughs> and they say, Moses' law said this woman should be stoned. But what do you say? Does anybody here remember what Jesus done? Jesus knelt down and wrote with his finger, now, don't get your theology from gospel songs because they write what rhymes and has rhythm. Get your theology from the word of God. Gospel song says he wrote in the sand. But the Bible didn't say he wrote in the sand. The Bible said he wrote with his finger on the ground. Now, you got to understand where Jesus was in Capernaum. There was no sand. There was no soil. The ground was solid rock. And they had just said, Moses' law said, 
by the way, you wrote it, but Moses' law said, what do you say? And they watched that same finger that wrote on the stone on the mountain with Moses start writing in the stone on the ground. We speculated what he wrote. Honey, it doesn't matter what he wrote. When he started carving with his finger and the rock on the ground, it was it to say, don't talk to me about Moses, law boy. I'm the one who wrote the law of Moses. I remember what I wrote. <laughs> when I write, I just write it in the stone. When I write it, it's forever settled in heaven. The promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen. Not one of them are changed. Not one of them are movable. They are immutable forever in the word of God. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Woo! May I continue just to the little white boy from Arkansas continue just for a moment here? Now listen. So God gets up there and he starts writing the law of Moses. The law for Moses. And he hands Moses the constitution of Bilos on this rock. And Moses is standing there enjoying the worship service with God. And it's one of the only times that God ever had to beg somebody to leave church. And God says, say, Moses... Church is over. You need to go. I guarantee you God's never had to say that here. You ever know God ever stopped saying that? No. Some of you wish the Lord would speak to me right now. We've been here long enough. Just go I'll volunteer for the mission field if you'll just shut up. <laughs> Hang on just a bit. Can I have just a few minutes? So God says, tell him to go home. Oh, you need to go home. Because we've got a problem down there. The people have corrupted themselves. They have replaced me. Remember my people's committed to evil? First of all, they've forsaken me. But then they went looking for another God. They hewed him out of sister and broken sister. Now let me tell you all the backside of what's happened. God gets so mad that God's anger gets so vexed that he says, Moses, if you'll step out of the way, I'm going to kill them all. God's just wrote a bylaw to adopt them as his people. And in a few short minutes, God's ready to kill the nation he was birthing. I got something I need to preach to you. And Moses started preaching to God. Now let me remind you, when Moses got called to preach, do you all remember the first thing Moses said to God when, when he didn't want to preach? God, I, I can't speak. I got a stuttering tongue. I'd be like, oh, 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 oh open your Bible to the book, 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 Exodus, I, 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 I want to preach. God, ain't nobody going to want to listen to me. God said, you're right. God didn't argue with him. I made your tongue. I know you stutter, but your brother is a whirlwind speaker. He's an amazing motivational speaker. I'm going to tell you what to say. You give the notes of the sermon to Moses, I mean to Aaron, your brother, and Aaron's going to preach them. And that's how we're going to work this thing. That's how, is that not the deal that God worked it out to start with? Can I narrate this story? Is that all right? That's just, this is, Pastor, I'm, I'm going so far, Father. I'm headed somewhere. I'm headed somewhere. And so, and so God says, here's how you, he'll preach it. You write the sermon and he'll preach it. Are y'all ready for this? And so Moses knows nobody wants to hear Moses preach. And Moses takes off and starts preaching to God. Now, let me talk to y'all about something. Y'all think us Jesus name preachers, all we talk about is Jesus name. But do y'all know what Moses preached to God? Lord! What's he going to do to your name? Moses started preaching to God a one God in Jesus' name sermon. And Moses is the only preacher in your Bible that when he gets done preaching, the man who says, I stutter so bad they wouldn't want to hear me preaching, God agreed with him. When Moses got done preaching, he had God in the altar. Wow! Because the verse ends, it says, and the Lord repented. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. My God, what a preacher.
preacher. When you got God, repent. Oh, y'all hear me? I came to get church folks to repent. But can you imagine being such a preacher that you got God saying, oh, I'm sorry, I wish I hadn't have said that. And when you got God saying, I'm changing my mind. Moses, you convinced me. What a one God apostolic Jesus name message Moses must have preached to have God saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just shut up. I won't kill him. Just let that soak burn. Moses walks away from that sermon. He's got under his arm the law of God written by the finger of God in stone. Now you tell me, where else in the world is there a better copy of that? You can't buy it on Amazon. eBay don't have it. The, the local antique store doesn't have it. No museum has it. Moses is holding under his arm a one-of-a-kind document. Say this with me. Moses holds under his arm, say this, a once a lifetime opportunity. He holds under his arm a once a lifetime opportunity. And Moses leaves the presence of God and gets down to the base of the mountain with Joshua and they hear all the worship service going on. And they said, it's not a cry of war. It's, it, it sounds like a cry of worship, but it don't seem like. And when they get there, now watch this. Now watch this. Let me, let me, let me, let me stop right here. Let me stop it. Let's back up just a moment. Who did I tell you was the preacher of the bunch? Aaron was the preacher of the bunch. Now, now I want to ask Pastor Tibbs. I want to talk, interview Pastor Tibbs just a moment. And, and, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to offend y'all, but I want to talk to you. that run 3 million people and 100% of the people were so moved and persuaded by that sermon that they all left their houses, walked out of a place they couldn't even point on a map on a hope that they're going to get houses they didn't build in the city. That is Can you imagine tonight? Now you've heard your husband
just going to poll the crowd. Is there anybody be willing to step in and sign those scriptures? No. There you go. But Aaron talked off of two million people into walking across the Red Sea when they couldn't even see the other side. What a preacher. What an orator. What a speaker. What a motivator. Are you all here? Let me talk to you about that man with talent and ability. Moses never went to, a, Aaron never went to a mountain. We don't read where Aaron ever went to a mountain to consecrate himself to God. Aaron was just the speaker. That was all he was. He was good at what he'd done. Let me talk to you about a preacher that has talent and ability and no commitment. He'll be the same guy who may talk to you good when, when he's got a sermon from the Lord, but he just may be the next guy to lead you into idolatry. And that same preacher who had talked them to leave their house, who had talked them into walking across the Red Sea, is now a preaching this message. This golden calf is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Be careful when you follow a man with charm, talent, and ability, and no commitment. He'll be the guy that will lead you into idolatry. Come on, somebody. I'm tired of being led by emotionally charged men. Give me somebody that has a commitment to the word of God. He may not preach his way out of a wet paper bag, but I need somebody with a commitment to the work of God. With a commitment to the glory of God. I don't want to be led into idolatry. Because that man with charm and charisma may lead me in a place I don't need to be. Moses gets down there and finds his associate pastor is preaching a message that is so unbiblical. And you know what breaks his heart? There is not one elder of Israel that stands up and says, no, 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 we ain't having that here. 100% they're swaying, dancing to an idolatrous golden calf. Are y'all here? They're worshiping against something their very eyes saw. They watched Moses, Aaron engrave that thing. They watched Aaron build that thing. Oh, you'll hear. And they worship. You think tonight, well, you know, I just don't see God working, so it's hard for me to worship. Are you kidding? They watched the man build something and knew that what he was preaching was not even the truth. Yet they worship because worship has nothing to do with what you see or what you feel. Worship has to do with the truth of knowing the word of God is on your side. They knew the man was lying, yet they still worshiped. Moses comes down from the mountain and he sees all this. And Moses gets mad. And you know, Joshua steps out in time and says, Who's on the Lord's side? Yeah. Not Moses. Moses takes this person. Ready? That meek man who just was on the mountain. so far, man? How many give me five more minutes? Timmy, give me five more minutes. We can hold your hand up. You can thank you. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. God says, Moses steps out and Moses makes his first move. Moses says, who's on my side? Levites are the only one who come and stand beside me. Watch what happens to Moses says, who all brought your sword? What would you do tonight if something, something got so chaotic here and I jumped up in this pulpit and said, I don't raise your hand. How many's packing? Now, I just come from Texas not too long ago. I would not dare ask that question down there. I saw them big Pentecostal hairdos, these big beehive things with curls. I bet there was guns in them things. Where if anything happened, that old woman could go. Bless the nines, the glocks, the 38s. I've sat in congregations on platforms and wondered just how many pistols am I preaching to? Moses said, how many is packing heat today? And they pulled their swords out to show it. And here's what Moses said. I want everybody just to kill your neighbor. 
Moses had the same impulse to those people's failure that God had. He had just talked God out of killing everybody, and now Moses is ready to kill them. I'm headed somewhere. We're going to get to this. And when the service is over that day, there are 3,000 dead bodies all over that worship center. Let me show you something beautiful here. The law of God was trying to be introduced. And when the law of God was being introduced, when the law was coming in, the letter of the law was coming in, 3,000 people died because the letter killeth. But when the Holy Ghost fell, and the spirit came to the church 3,000 was saved in one day because the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life yes. 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 Woo, that's enough to make a mommy dance right there I said the letter may kill the law may kill but the spirit of God I don't need another sermon on law I need the spirit of God I want the glory of God I need something that will make us alive, not something that will kill us. I'm almost done. Moses gets through and he marches out after he's been responsible for 3,000 people getting killed. Everybody, they will stand at the doors of their tent, and the tents are built in a circle all the way around the church, the ark of the, 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 the tent of the testimony, with the door facing the tent, and they're all watching Moses. Moses walks out of, out of his speaking place and he goes toward that tent and he stands in front of the door of that tent and when he does, that pillar of fire comes down over Moses. And when they saw that, the Bible said that he was Moses goes in and starts talking to God. You know the first thing God talks to Moses about? God doesn't talk to Moses about the people's sin. God starts talking to Moses about breaking the Moses, I gave you convinced that when Moses threw those rocks down and broke that once in a lifetime opportunity, I'm convinced that the sound of the breaking of those songs rung louder in Moses' ear than all the idolatrous worship of the children of Israel. Are you with me here tonight? I'm convinced that that hung over Moses' head like a cloud. God said, I wrote that on stone. You can't replace it. And now you broke it. And Moses begins to repent to God for breaking the commandments of God. And God says, here's the deal. You saw what the rocks looked like. You saw what the... I give them to you the first time. This time you've got to hew them out. But boy, if you'll hew them out and if you'll climb the mountain, I'm the God who can give you a second chance at a once in a lifetime opportunity. Come, let us reason together. Though thy sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. You might have had the Holy Ghost. You might have backslid. You might have walked out on God and broke a once in a lifetime opportunity. But let me tell you about a God who is willing to restore. A God who is willing to show you another chance at a once in a lifetime opportunity. He's a God of second chances. Now watch this. Moses says, God says, Moses, you understand that the only thing that made those rocks holy was my finger. I'm going to tell you something, friend. You cannot make yourself holy. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. I'm not doing too good tonight. I come to tell you something. You can't make yourself holy. Try as you will. You can, oh, come on, somebody. You can keep all the law. You can keep all the word of God, but it will never make you holy. Only the Holy Ghost can make you holy. It takes a sovereign work of God. Holiness, oh, come on, somebody. You can't buy holiness at Walmart. You can't buy holiness at J.C. Penney. You can't buy, my God, where y'all at tonight? Holiness has to come through the power of the Holy Ghost. If the Holy Ghost can make you holy, you will never be holy. Holiness is not something you buy off of a clothes rack. Holiness is not a hairstyle. 
Holiness comes from the Holy Ghost. So then do I have to walk in holiness? Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. God says, I'm not going to write on just any rock. You saw the pattern in the law yesterday. So you've got to do some homework. And before I make it holy, you've got to make the rock acceptable. doesn't anoint rebels. God doesn't bless people that's in rebellion. Oh, come on, somebody. God will never make somebody holy that says, I don't care what God thinks. I don't care what the church thinks. You look in the book and try to align yourself with the word of God. And as you try to do that, the Holy Ghost will come into your life and will make you something that you could have never been on your own. You and God partner together in this outfit. You make yourself acceptable and God will make you holy. Give the Lord a clap up for the praise. So, so he climbs the mountain. He gets there. God makes it holy. God writes it down on the stone again. And God's talking to Moses. And God's talking to Moses like this. Y'all ready to hear God's conversation? God says, Tell the people to keep feast days. Tell them to pay their tithe. Tell them the Sabbath days to keep hunting. I mean, holy. You get that on your way home. That's just tell them to keep all the feast, the dirt, the law. Don't murder nobody. Don't take nobody's wife. Don't be less than that. Don't be a tracker. All the stuff God starts telling them to do. And while God is talking to Moses about a second chance, first God says, Moses, just take them, lead them up to your own name. I'm done. Moses says, no, no, God, if you're not going with us, don't send us. Because we're not interested in doing this without you. That's right. Amen. Now watch this. In the middle of it all, you read Exodus 30. I want you to hear this right now. Turn your hearing aids on if you don't hear another thing I say tonight. I want you to hear this. And you're like, well, why didn't you just say that an hour ago? We done been dismissed. This may be the most important thing I say all night. Moses' mind is not with the law of God. Moses is not even interested in the second chance opportunity. Moses has acted like an idiot before the people of God. Moses has let his ego get in the way and said, who's with me? And Moses has made 3,000 of God's people die. And on his way out of the camp up the mountain, Moses has heard him say, let's tie Moses up and stone him. And let's get a new preacher and let's go back where we came from. And Moses knows Right now, I'm in the presence of God. But when I walk out of this service, I'm going to have to deal with some real problems when I get back. I'm going to have to give an account for why I killed 3,000 people. I'm going to deal with 3,000 funerals with families looking at me and say, Moses, why did you have to do it like that? And it's all going to be my fault. And when I walk out trying to be God's man, I'm going to have to deal with a lot of guilt. I'm going to have to deal with a lot of shame. I'm going to have to deal with my past. Oh, come on. I'm preaching better than some of you are shouting right now. Has anybody else had to got, had got anything outside the door of this worship center you're going to have to deal with when you leave here? Any of you got any pain outside that you got to deal with? Anybody got family you got to try to reconnect with after you leave here? And it'd be easy just to stay here and worship. But when you get back on the job, you got to deal with that boss again. You got to deal with that cranky. Oh, come on, somebody. We've all got things outside. When you get home tonight, that disease is still going to be there. That symptom's still going to be there. You're going to have to take all your medicine before you go to bed. You're going to have to deal with real problems when you leave. You got kids. It's an 
all kinds of chaos. Uh, my friend, when you're standing in the presence of God, it's hard to worship. When God's making you precious promises, we come into service and God tries to get us to look at the promises he's making us. Uh, and it's hard to worship uh, because we're sitting here saying, when I leave this building, it's going to be different. Uh, I'm not going to feel this rush of glory. I'm not going to feel this emotion. Uh, I'm worried about what I'm going to deal with when I get back down from this service and it's over. And Moses interrupts God and starts talking to God about something God's not talking about. And Moses interrupts God while God is preaching and he says, I beseech you, show me your glory. When I leave this mountain, I need to know more than who I am. I need to know more than just what I've got to deal with. I need to see some of who you are so that when I walk down from this mountain and I have to deal with my issues tomorrow, I'll have something here that has empowered me and something here that has changed me. I need something to give me hope because it's hopeless when I walk out that door. When I walk out of that service, God, I've got to deal with the real stuff. I'm beseeching you before I leave. Show me your glory. Let me see you. Let me feel your power. Let me know that there's more in this world than law and prophets. God looks at Moses and says, nobody can see my glory and live. Moses says, I'm willing to die. <laughs> Y'all hear? I'm willing to risk it. I'd rather die trying to see God's glory than deal with the junk I got to deal with without it tomorrow. I'm sorry, I, I don't like to preach this long, but I'm almost done. I told you that 30 minutes ago, but I've closed my Bible this time. Listen here. Moses says, please show me your glory. The Lord says, nobody can see my glory and live. And then God says, but there is a place by me in the cleft of a, oh, you ain't hearing me. In the cleft of a, in the cleft of a, Oh, come on, shout it better now. In the cleft of a... Moses, you don't feel like going to church again because you're so hurt from the experience you had at the last worship service. But Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Thank God for Facebook Live. Thank God for internet. But there's nothing like going to the address where Jesus is building the church. <laughs> Moses, you may not want to go there again. You may want to watch it on a satellite remote. But I'm going to build the church on a rock. And if you can go one more time back to that address and crawl right back on the church. Oh, come on, somebody. In spite of your failure, in spite of your backsliding, in spite of your mess, if you can get back to the church one more time, I will show you. I know what you've done. I know what the people done. But if you go where I'm building a church, I'll still show you my glory. And in spite of all of your backsliding, if you can manage to get back to the building one more time, Moses climbs up on that rock and stands before the Lord. Now watch this. And the Lord said, before I show you my glory, I need to preach to you. Are you kidding me? Yesterday, Moses was preaching to God and had God in the altar. But I don't care how good you preached yesterday. There's going to come a tomorrow. You're going to need somebody to preach to you. And Moses steps up on that rock. And God didn't do a singing ceremony. God said, I'm going to do a preaching ceremony. Oh, do y'all remember what Jesus, what Jesus preached to Moses that day? You think us oneness preachers are bad? It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Watch what the Bible said. And the Lord declared unto Moses his name. 
There's really not much more to preach than the name of Jesus. It's the name we're saved by. It's the name we're healed by. And we are complete in him who is the head of all principalities. I don't need any other message. Just let me preach Jesus. And when God started preaching to Moses, he declared unto him his name. Watch this. Because before you can see unprecedented glory, you must first be convinced of the authority and the power of the name. Until you understand and embrace the name, you will never see unprecedented glory. But when God, oh, y'all hear you. I got a question. I want to ask you this. Anybody got something outside that overwhelms you before you came here, after you leave? Something, anything in your life overwhelming? Everybody's got life just by the horns. You're doing well tonight. Well, let me tell you, I don't have it all together. I'm struggling with a few things in my life. And today, there was a few times that I rode down the street today with tears rolling down my face. But I come back to the church today because when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I need to be in the house of God tonight. I need to be around the family. When my heart's overwhelmed, lead me to the rock. Tire. I'm almost done. And then God said to Moses, I'm going to lay my hands on you. We're going to have an impartation service here when I'm done preaching. And I'm going to cause my glory to pass before you. You're not going to see it coming. You're not going to see it when it gets there. But when I move my hand, you're going to see the effects of everywhere my glory has been. He is the invisible God. And tonight you won't see him walk these aisles touching people. But when he gets through touching them, you're going to see everywhere Jesus has been. I was, I was, preaching, in the, I was preaching revival years ago in the state of um, confusion. And uh, while I was preaching there, this woman walked up to me. and I'd been preaching in worship and she walked up to me at the door and she said, Hey, preacher. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you can't take that Bible and show me where Jesus ever shouted. You can't show me in the Bible where Jesus ever hoped, where Jesus ever hollered. Can't show me in the Bible where Jesus ever spoke in tongues and jumped around. Can you? I said, no, ma'am. She said, if you could show me in that Bible where Jesus ever did it, I'll do it myself. But until you could show me, I ain't doing it. It ain't in there, is it, preacher? Man, you ever just had the anointing to want to slap somebody runs up in? I thought, man, lay hands on her now. She will eventually recover the Bible says. And the Holy Ghost rose up in me. And as she's fixing to prance away, I tapped her on the shoulder. And I said, you're right, sister. I can't show you in that Bible where Jesus ever ran. I can't show you in that Bible where Jesus ever shouted or where Jesus ever hooped or hollered or got emotional. And she smiled like real smug. I said, but I can show you in that Bible that everybody he touched did. Everybody he laid his hand on did. I come to tell you I run because he touched me. I shout because I saw his glory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Watch this. Moses saw the effects of the glory of God. And when Moses left church that day, armed with an anointing, he's going to go home and he's going to preach funerals. He's going to answer questions. He's going to get questioned by all these people about what he did. And he's going to get accusations for what he done. When he leaves the mountain that day, and here's where I close. When he got to the foot of that mountain. I'm going to come back here and speak to this elder right here. When he got to the foot of that mountain, they did nobody ask him about 3,000 people dying. Nobody said a word about his temper. 
Nobody said a word about his mistakes because all they could see was a glow from the face of Moses where he had been in the glory of God. And God literally changed the narrative of the story. And when he went down expecting to hear all kinds of accusations, all he heard was a testimony. Cover your face. The glory of God is upon you. And I tell you, I want God to move tonight and show us his glory to where when we leave this place, everything is changed. The narrative of the story is changed. I believe here tonight, feeling like I'm going to have to deal with one thing, but let it be so powerful that what I'm dealing with is everybody see the glory of God upon our lives. Give the Lord a clap off and a praise today. <laughs> Would you stand with me all over this house? Musicians, please return. Somebody shout it with me. Show me, Show me. Thy, glory. thy glory. Lord, take you to where when I leave here, nobody remembers my failures. When I leave here, let me be so influenced and so marked by the Holy Ghost that every backsliding is healed. Change the subject to where instead of us talking about that that is sad and depressing, all we can talk about is the goodness of God that changed the story. I want to ask a question tonight. God didn't send me with a message for people that are not here. He never has in 32 years. Somebody in this building, you got stuff you're having to deal with. And the Lord says, I'd like to change the very thought pattern that you're thinking about. I'd like to influence your family and everybody. Oh, come on, somebody. Wasn't everybody at the mountain? Just because your lost loved ones are not here tonight doesn't mean that you can't take such glory home to them. That the story changes. Aaron is who messed up, and Aaron didn't get to go to the service but Aaron was there and said, you better cover your face. There's a glory. I believe tonight God's going to touch people that are not even here by the power of God that's in this house tonight. Do you all believe that? I'm just going to ask a question. Does anybody have needs beyond this building? Does anybody in this building raise your hand and say, I, I, got, I got situations beyond right here that I, I really need the Lord to deal with tonight? I think there ought to be a cry rise from this church today. So saying, Lord, save my daughter-in-law. or God, straighten that boss out. I think tonight we actually ought to walk out of our pews and come around this front with hands lifted and cry like Moses. Show me your glory.